last week's discussion, there was a lot about responsibility. In order to really understand the responsibility, you have to realize that there was a resistance, very, very small, but very, very significant in high places. And I put up three references for those of you who would <coughs> like to uh, go into that subject on your own. The first one, German Resistant to Hitler by Peter Hoffman. Dr. Hoffman spoke here a few years ago. And uh, we have, possibly in the library, there may be a few of these soft-covered editions, modifications of his main book. <coughs> but his main book, as well as the second book, Dietrich Bonhoeffer by Eberhard Besky, are in the public library. I know that for a fact, that's where I read them. Dietrich Bonhoeffer was a leading churchman. If you want to understand, it turned, so it happens that the major resistance that Hitler couldn't handle was the church resistance. There was a significant amount of it. When you read that biography of Bonhoeffer, it'll give you some indication there. The third one is available on videotape. It's in some of the tape school, the stores. I've seen it. And it's a small book in the library, which should be of most interest to most of you here, called The White Rose. And that was the story of the German university student resistance. Students gave their lives against Hitler. <clears throat> Some of you have asked for um, copies of the whole lecture series, you know, the flyers that we have. They're here. If any of you want them, just help yourself. They're on the front table. Can you use this? Yeah, sure. Okay. Sure, sure. Okay. Now for the beginning. Uh, good afternoon. My name is Sylvia Sucker, and I'm a member of the Alliance for the Study of the Holocaust which co-sponsors this lecture series. Today we are at the third lecture of this series, and today we begin to deal with the historical context of the Holocaust. Our lecturer is Professor Robert Brown of the History Department. Professor Brown has been involved with the lecture series from its inception eight years ago. He received his doctorate from the University of Paris in modern and contemporary history. He's been in the history department of Sonoma State University since 1967 and is a full professor of history. Please welcome Professor Brown. I'm not sure I need the microphone, but I have to have somebody to give these up. Uh, maybe half this side and half. I guess you can just kind of have them out here. They're not answering at IRC. Maybe you could go down there and just pass a message on. We want somebody to check the slide. Check. Maybe, why, why don't you wait just a minute? And okay. get on. <laughs> Testing. Fun little sound here. I, I, in the last couple of times that we've met, I know that uh, some people have had some trouble. Uh, hearing what was going on, and 
you want to be sure in a uh, subject like this that you hear everything plainly that's being said because obviously it's a very emotional subject and uh, it's one that uh, uh, one needs clear communication about. What I plan today, I, I have promised myself that I will keep the lecture to about this. So if anybody wants to time me, go ahead. Uh, I have a few slides at the end of the lecture and I'm trying to leave plenty of time uh, for questions because I think that this course works best when people can get into it with their own questions. Uh, very often I think uh, you will see the subject from a somewhat different perspective uh, than I do and therefore it's good to have an exchange. Uh, what I want to start out by uh, trying to do is the historical context of the Holocaust. Last week we saw Night and Fog, a very moving and very devastating documentary of the Holocaust. Uh, it's one that usually leaves uh, people out of breath and asking the question, how could that have ever happened? I think that there is an historical explanation for that which at least explains part of it. And by looking at the history of the development of the Holocaust, I think it's uh, to get a clearer understanding of how it was from, really it's from 1941 to 1945, when the Holocaust takes place, that the Nazi government, the German Nazi government, could in a cold-blooded manner proceed with the extermination of somewhere between five and six million European Jews. So to understand how that came about, uh, as an historian, that you have to look at history. And I want to begin not too far back. I think you all, all you have to do is go back to World War I. Uh, world War I was a, uh, the first of the major world wars of the 20th century. Uh, Germany was the, the major power of what was called the Central Powers, which essentially consisted uh, of uh, Germany, the Austro-Hungarian Empire, the Ottoman Empire, and Germany lost that war. Germany went into the war as the dominant continental power. It was, in terms of its military might, it was more powerful than any other continental European power. Uh, the English, uh, the British, had the, uh, probably the most powerful navy in the world, but I think most people are agreed that the Germans had the most powerful land armies in the world. Uh, the collapse of Germany in 1918, after the Germans had fought almost all of the war outside of their own borders, was a stunning blow to the German nation and to all German citizens. Uh, there, was, uh, there was a tremendous impact from World War I on Europe and the world. Uh, notably, four empires fell apart. The German Empire fell apart, the Austro-Hungarian Empire fell apart, the Ottoman Empire fell apart, and by way of digression I might note there has not been any stability uh, in the Mideast and in the Arab world since that happened, uh, and also the Russian Empire fell apart. The fall of the Russian Empire brought into the world for the first time a society devoted to the ideas of revolutionary socialism, or as they came to be called, Bolshevism. Um, so that the geographical changes were the four empires fell apart. In addition, the peace settlements resulted in the establishment of about eight new nations. Uh, Finland, Latvia, Estonia, Lithuania, Poland, Czechoslovakia, Hungary, and Yugoslavia all came into being. It, there were tremendous geographical changes as a result of the uh, defeat of the Central Powers during World War I. The political changes were equally important. When the war broke out in 1914, there were two major ideologies in conflict, what one could call traditional conservatism and liberalism. Now, liberalism is most easily defined as a constitutional form of government with a stress on individual rights, separation of powers, um, and 
to be perfectly frank about the economic structure. Traditional conservatism, on the other hand, depended upon the traditional powers in the European state. They were notably powers that surrounded the uh, monarchy, the church, uh, many in 1914, Many members of the old European aristocracy still were firm believers in what you would call traditional conservatism. And uh, it's interesting to note that it was essentially the conservative powers that went down to defeat in 1918. It's the German Empire, the Austro-Hungarian Empire, the Ottoman Empire, and the Russian Empire. They were all really conservative. Russia had fought on the side of Great Britain and France, which were liberal powers. And it looked very much, I mean, 1918, in an ideological sense, in a political sense, marked the triumph of the liberal powers of the world, France, Great Britain, and the United States. If you'll recall, the United States joined uh, the war in 1917. The entry of the United States into the war was a decisive uh, action. It probably changed the war from what was essentially a stalemate to a victory for the Allies who represented liberalism in the world. It also made the United States a world power. Uh, the United States went into uh, uh, the war in 1917, or went into the war in 1914 by supplying notably France and Great Britain, went into the war a debtor nation, came out of the war a creditor and a world power. So war, war has meant a lot to the United States in terms of its position of power in the world. So there was an apparent triumph of liberalism. Just to make the point clear, the Weimar Republic, which became the German form of government, the, the Kaiser, the Kaiser fled in 1918. German government fell apart. It was replaced by a Weimar Republic, which in fact was a liberal government. Somebody mentioned last week, the Weimar Republic was one of the most paper, was one of the most beautiful constitutional governments ever, ever conceived, had all the rights that you could ever demand of a government. It had a couple of major problems with it. Number one, it had been imposed by the Allies on Germany. And number two, Germany had never been much of a democratic country. Germany, Germany down to 1914, had essentially been a conservative country. There was one flirt flirtation with liberalism in 1848 which lasted for about three years and uh, was quickly forgotten. One should keep in mind that the ideas of liberalism essentially come out of the Demo democratic revolutions of the 18th century, uh, the American Revolution and the French Revolution. Germany historically was opposed to the French Revolution and therefore the ideas of liberalism found very stony in Germany. So that when the Weimar Republic was imposed upon the Germans in 1918, it was seen to be exactly that, a foreign imposition on a country that had never believed very much in liberalism. So uh, hence the apparent triumph of liberalism. Well, the Versailles Treaty was a treaty arranged by the uh, uh, allies, mainly the three main uh, allies were the United States, Britain, France. Under the leadership of Woodrow Wilson, uh, the United States tried to, well, there's historical controversy about that, the United States tried to mitigate the kind of harsh peace treaty that uh, Georges Clemenceau, the French Prime Minister, and David Lloyd George, the British Prime Minister, wanted for Germany. And um, the provisions of the treaty turned out to be exceptionally harsh. They fall into three categories. There were territorial laws Germans, there were reparations, and there was forced disarmament. Germany, who had been, which had been the, uh, the major military nation in Europe, found itself reduced to an army of 100,000 men. Uh, that was far from the millions that had fought in World War I. Germany was forced to accept the provisions of this uh, draconian peace treaty uh, and uh, resented the peace treaty very, very deeply. The, uh, in fact, the Germans had a hard time finding somebody to, to sign the peace treaty. Uh, they finally found uh, Matthias Erzberger, who had the courage 
Actually, the Allies gave Germany an ultimatum that they would either sign the peace treaty by a certain day at a certain hour or they would be occupied by the Allied troops. It was uh, either sign it or face a uh, continuing occupation. Erzberger had the courage to sign the peace treaty. He was later paid back when a German nationalist assassinated him a few years later because he had proved himself to be, uh, in the eyes of many German nationalists, a traitor. There, there it's clear that the Germans hated the treaty. Uh, the the uh, people who were running the Weimar Republic were essentially social democrats. And as you look at the elections that take place, 1919 to 1933 when Hitler comes to power, what you're aware of is that there is a constant movement politically from the social democrats who were a left party in Germany toward the right that every election more and more German rightists or nationalists were elected. So that uh, uh, the treaty that was imposed upon Germany uh, was uh, a treaty that was uh, seen by everybody to be a very treaty. And uh, how do you explain the harshness of the treaty? Well, it was partly because of the tremendous losses that had taken place in Europe, in France, in Britain. and. Uh, the British and the French primarily, but, but Wilson, uh, some of the recent historiography of Wilson uh, suggests that he was not such a, uh, uh, so much in favor of a uh, lenient peace treaty, that on crucial issues, uh, Wilson was uh, just as bad as uh, David Lloyd George and Georges Clemenceau. Uh, that is, Wilson came out of a kind of a puritanical background. He believed the Germans should be punished for what they had done. And so that although historically Wilson has generally seen to be a, a liberal who above all wanted the acceptance of the League of Nations, which he lost out on anyway, uh, that in fact recent historiography tends to show that Wilson did not differ a great deal from uh, Clemenceau and, uh, and Lloyd George. So we get into the Weimar period of, uh, of Germany, 1919 to 1933. Uh, it's a fascinating time. If you want to read good history, and you want, if you like politics, political, not only political debate, but political conflict and generation of a whole lot of new ideas, Germany in the period of the 1920s is a fascinating period of history because so much was going on in our culture, there are movies being made. Uh, it's, it's a fascinating period uh, to read about. And uh, uh, it was also a time of tremendous turmoil. Uh, I should back up and say that uh, uh, in 1917, the Russian Revolution had begun in what quickly, quickly became the Soviet Union. And uh, the Soviet Union went through a civil war. The Bolshevik government established itself. And it saw itself as an enemy of liberalism. After all, liberalism is a capitalistic system. And uh, the Russian revolutionaries were socialists, revolutionary socialists. They saw world history across the uh, perspective of a class warfare. And they saw the United States, Britain, France, and the new Weimar Germany essentially as enemies uh, of the, uh, the revolutionary efforts that were going on in the Soviet <laughs> Union. Uh, also in 1920, in most uh, countries in the world, a uh, communist party was formed, that uh, communists had Bolsheviks, communists, revolutionary socialists, they all mean the same, uh, that uh, communism uh, saw itself as a international movement that it would appeal to all the workers of the world, and uh, the formation of those parties in the, liberal, in the liberal nations of the world were very disquieting. Uh, there's a famous Palmer words in the United States in 1919, 1920, where about a thousand people uh, who had uh, supposedly socialist backgrounds, the, uh, the Americans tended not to distinguish between democratic socialists and revolutionary socialists. Democratic socialists want socialism, but they're willing to do it by uh, regular political means. Revolutionary socialists are willing to uh, foment revolution in order to achieve their goals. 
Americans tended not to distinguish between democratic and revolutionists. But in 1919, 1920, about a thousand socialists were thrown out of the country uh, on the general suspicion that uh, they meant the United States government no good. Uh, so that the establishment of the uh, Russian Revolution in the world, the establishment of communist parties throughout mu much of Europe, added to this time of uh, turmoil. Uh, and very quickly, the German Communist Party became one of the major parties in Germany. Uh, it was particularly in and around the German capital of Berlin. So in the 1930s, generally whenever you see a film about the 1930s, you can expect to, to see a few scenes of street fights between uh, German fascists, who were essentially nationalists, uh, and, uh, and the German communists, who generally wanted to overthrow the uh, Weimar Republic. Of course, the Weimar Republic was liberal, and so the liberals in Germany tended to get caught in between the two extremes. The national uh, extreme, who hated the Treaty of Versailles, what it had done to Germany, and the German Communist Party that wanted to overthrow the, uh, uh, the Weimar Republic because it was a capitalistic uh, liberal society. The Great Depression hit Germany with tremendous force. Uh, it's been estimated that by about 1930, 50% of the German working force was either unemployed or grossly underemployed. Uh, the growth of the Nazi party was particularly noticeable after the uh, depression hit Germany in the, uh, in the late, late 1929 and early 1930. And in fact, the, uh, uh, the Germans became in elections in, uh, uh, well, Hitler comes to power in 1933, but in, in the years just before he came to power, the Germans actually achieved uh, uh, their greatest vote totals. They never had more than a plurality. The best election they had in the early 1930s, 42 percent of the uh, voting pop, uh, of the voters voted for uh, the Nazi Party. Now, let me talk a little bit about Nazi Germany. I have to define I have to define fascism, and I'm going to define it in terms of what the fascists stood for, and in terms of what the fascists stood against. The fascists essentially were a nationalistic, one could even call it an extreme nationalistic party, the interests of Germany above and beyond anything else. Fascists were also militaristic. They celebrated martial uh, values. Uh, they tended to claim that Germany had not lost the war. Germany had been stabbed in the back. Uh, Hitler believed Germany had been stabbed in the back by the Jews. Uh, the fascists were also, at least in Germany, and particularly in Germany, uh, fascists were racist. Fascism is a worldwide movement in the 1930s. I think it's fair to say that uh, uh, not only were, were uh, uh, Germany and Italy fascist, Japan was a fascist nation. The military took power in Japan, uh, and Japan tended to believe, consider itself to be a superior uh, society, one that had the right to rule over other people. But in addition, fascism, you're aware that fascism spreads all over the world. Uh, there was a British fascist party. There, were a lot, there was a, a lot of fascist parties in France. They almost knocked over the government in the mid-1930s. Uh, there was fascism in Hungary throughout. Pretty much throughout the world, there is a fascist movement. Now, a key characteristic of fascism is that it tends to be exclu exclusionary. Okay? In, in Germany, Nazism takes even a more radical turn. Um, you can just call the uh, German Nazis straight out, straight out racist. Uh, but most fascist parties were exclusionary in the sense that they always considered that they represented the better elements of any society. And they tended to define out of society those people with whom they did not agree, either politically or socially or ideologically. And so uh, the fascism that gets established in Germany in the 1930s is really part of a general worldwide movement. 
there are, it's very disconcerting to uh, recognize that there were certain Americans who were very sympathetic to the German fascists, German Nazis. Uh, people like Henry Ford, uh, people like Charles Lindbergh, Father Coughlin, uh, Huey Long, in some respects, uh, is a reflection of the fact that fascism was, in, was in fact, a, a worldwide movement. Um, what did fascism stand against? It was anti-communist. Communism, in the form that it developed in the Soviet Union, was, in theory, an international movement. And it tried to appeal to the workers everywhere in the world. Well, the German fascists were nationalists. They, had, they didn't want any truck with uh, internationalism. They didn't, they didn't believe in international. They believed in German supremacy in the world. And actually, the, uh, the, the Nazi party was in continual conflict with the German working class, trying to win as many members of the German working class into their own, uh, into their own Nazi party. So that uh, fascism was anti-communist or anti-Marxist. Uh, fascism was also anti-liberal in the sense that the fascists generally believed that constitutional government it uh, turned to corruption too easily. Uh, it essentially, uh, the argument was of the German, German fa fascists everywhere, as a matter of fact, the argument was that uh, the uh, people who ran liberal society essentially ran it in their own interest and not in the interests of uh, the uh, great bulk of the uh, population of that society. So generally, parliamentary government or constitutional government or liberalism in general was done by the fascists as an inappropriate form of government. The, uh, the fascists also tended to be anti-intellectual, that in values, uh, they distrusted reason. There are many statements by Hitler uh, to, the, to the effect that uh, reason is not to be trusted. You can trust your heart, your emotions. And uh, the Nazis, in many ways, through propaganda, through various uh, parties, through marches, uh, directly appealed to the emotion as the best guide uh, to a uh, decent political society. And very effectively, Hitler, Hitler and his uh, uh, supporters played uh, the propaganda game for the hearts of the German, German uh, people very, very uh, effectively. The, uh, the Nazi party fought with the communists and fought with the liberals of the Weimar Republic all through the 1920s <laughs> and uh, got, got their greatest uh, electoral victories in the early 30s and by some backdoor maneuvering came to, party, uh, came to, came to power in 1933. Um, I want to talk a little bit about the extremely important racial component of German fascism or Nazism. Uh, I, I have a quote here. I mean, you can, uh, Hitler, if you read, you're very much aware of uh, Hitler's racial view of the world. He thought the world was essentially uh, a world in which superior races uh, should rule. And he felt that uh, clearly the Germans were a superior race and that every other group in the world, I mean, there were some good elements in, in certain groups, but in fact, uh, most other groups in the world uh, were inferior. And there's a very interesting quotation that I'll read from a, a, a fascist party uh, conference in 1930 where Hitler got into a debate and into uh, uh, a, a great uh, uh, dispute with one of the key members, of one of the key ideologues of the fascist party, a man named Otto Strasser. And Strasser later wrote about his uh, violent conflict with uh, Hitler uh, at that party conference in 1930. What Strasser had more or less argued was that uh, Germany in the 1930s should see the world from the point of view of, uh, of uh, 
people who were not playing their correct role in world affairs. Strachley argued that Germany should try to line up with oppressed peoples in the world because Germany was really oppressed. And Strasser suggested that Germany really should line up with people who were colonized. They should line up with the Soviet Union because, in fact, those peoples were oppressed peoples just like the Germans were. And the Germans were oppressed because they had had uh, put upon them uh, the, uh, the Versailles Treaty, which was, as I've already said, a very punitive uh, uh, treaty. So Strasser makes this argument, and Hitler gets up to respond to it. And listen to the way he responds to Strasser's argument that Germany is really part of the oppressed world. Hitler said, there is only one possible kind of revolution, and it is not economic or political or social, it is racial. All revolutions, and Hitler claimed, studied them all, have been racial. Your ideas of foreign policy, this was to Strasser, are false because you have no racial knowledge. Didn't you declare openly for the Indian independent independence movement when it was obviously a rebellion of the inferior Hindu race against the superior Anglo-Nordic race? The Nordic race has the right to dominate the world, and that right will be the guiding principle of our foreign policy. That is why any alliance with the Soviet Union a Slav, Tartar body surmounted by a Jewish head is out of the question, unquote. Very, very clearly in, 19, in 1930, uh, Hitler saw the, uh, the world through a racial lens. And uh, there's just, I mean, you can just go on and on about the, uh, the many times uh, that Hitler uh, uh, saw the world that way. In fact, I have included, if you want to, Take a quick look at the second page of the handout. Okay, this is uh, an excerpt from a book by Werner Mauser, Letters and Notes, uh, about Hitler. And these are, these are notes. What you see on the left is his handwriting. On the right are his notes from a political speech in the early 1920s. And uh, this is the way Hitler saw the world in 1924, and it remained consistent throughout his life. He linked the peace treaty and the Jewish question, and he argued, these are just the notes that he spoke from, the instigators of the war, that was World War I, the instigators of the German defeat, the instigators of the uh, uh, revolution, that was uh, when, when uh, the German government fell in 1918, there was a revolt in the uh, Spartacists, uh, Rosa Luxemburg and uh, Karl Liebknecht. Uh, they were Spartacists. They were actually uh, revolutionary socialists uh, who, in fact, ended up being gunned down and they were tossed into the uh, Spray River in, in Berlin. Uh, their bodies were. Uh, but the instigators of the revolution, the instigators of the armistice, the peace treaty are the same as the instigators of the Russian Bolshevism. Western and Eastern Jews, Germany's fate is the fate of Western Jews. Our task is the destruction of the Jews and so on. Uh, it's a, uh, it's kind of a, well, it's a uh, very strange view, view of the world. I mean, it all comes, everything that had happened to Germany since 1918 was seen by Adolf Hitler and by the supporting Nazis uh, as uh, a kind of a Jewish plot. And uh, you can read that very very clearly in Mein Kampf, if you want to pick it up. It's a fascinating book. Uh, there's a copy of it in the Sonoma State uh, Library, well annotated, and the editors have uh, essentially tried by their footnotes to, uh, to correct, uh, you know, or to give you as accurately as possible the history of the period. I mean, history, uh, history for Hitler was a tool to political power, and he consistently argued uh, that you had to see history through a racial lens. So uh, that, that's just a quick definition of, of fascism. It was uh, nationalistic, militaristic, uh, racial. It was opposed to liberalism, to Marxism. It was opposed to uh, uh, intellectuals, particularly those who reasoned. 
appeal to the emotion. Uh, Hitler, Hitler came to power, as I've said, in 1933. Uh, and there begins, I mean, it's absolutely extraordinary what Hitler has done in eight years. He starts out on a series of actions that give him control of Germany by 1941 when he invades the Soviet Union. Uh, Hitler goes through an astonishing series of domestic, diplomatic, and military victories uh, like I think no other leader in the world uh, has ever done. In eight short years, Hitler was on top, literally on top of the world, certainly on top of Europe. Uh, but let me just uh, indicate what a few of those uh, uh, domestic victories. Hitler comes to power January 30th, 1933. Within a few months, he's gotten the uh, German Reichstag to vote an enabling act that made Hitler a German dictator for four years. That is, that the German legislature simply gave their powers over to Hitler. Uh, he did that by uh, conniving a little bit. There was a famous fire in the Reichstag which permitted Hitler uh, to get the German communists banned from the Reichstag so that the German fascists had a majority in the Reichstag. And uh, a lot of other national parties came with Hitler and so in the, in, uh, in the vote on the Enabling Act, it was an over overwhelming domestic political victory for Hitler. Uh, he was given dictatorial powers for four years. In, uh, in six, on June 30th, 1934, Hitler took care of some old debts with members, some, some of the members were members of the German Nazi party who had had uh, uh, arguments with Hitler. And Hitler used violent force to kill. Uh, well, the, the figures vary. Somewhere between 70 and 200 people were killed, politi generally political opponents of Hitler. Uh, he purged his own party to uh, establish his authority firmly throughout the party. The, uh, the, the first concentration camps, uh, very early after Hitler comes to party and gets dictatorial powers, the first people into the concentration camps were not Jews necessarily, they were political uh, opponents of Hitler, particularly communists and, and democratic socialists. They went off to the camps early. Some of them actually survived. Uh, the entire war. They weren't, uh, they, were, they lived in very harsh conditions and most of them had their health broken, uh, but uh, a few of them actually survived the entire war in, in concentration camps. Uh, then there were the Nuremberg Laws. Hitler begins to take his first actions against the Jews in 1935. Uh, the Nuremberg Laws essentially made German Jews, who were legally full citizens, turn them into second-class citizens. They could not hold certain government positions. They couldn't work in the university. Uh, what Hitler was trying to do, and what, what I would argue is that the Holocaust, the, there's a debate over when the Holocaust is finally decided. It seems to me from what, what I've seen that you can't talk about the, the final solution. That is the decision to proceed with the physical destruction of as many European Jews as you can round up, that didn't begin probably until late 1941, 1942. What Hitler was doing in 35, I would argue, he was trying to put such pressure on German Jews that they would immigrate from Germany. Now, the, the Nuremberg Laws was one sign of this pressure. It just basically, it just said, Jews can't work anymore in certain professions. Uh, and uh, what it made, made life very uncomfortable for them. And so some began to immigrate, but strangely enough, before 19, not until about 1937, 1938, you would get any large number of German Jews leaving uh, Germany, that there were immigration quotas, uh, say, for the United States. They were never filled completely until about 1938, over oversubscribed uh, for one year. But you'll hear from Michael Williamson on the immigration. There, there is an important immig immigration aspect uh, to the Holocaust. Uh, but anyway, uh, Germany began its rearmament, uh, which put a lot of uh, workers in Germany back to work. Uh, Hitler got a lot of credit for, for that from the German, German workers. 
And then Hitler begins an astonishing number of diplomatic successes. German, Germany reoccupied the Rhine in 1936. That was forbidden by the Treaty of Versailles. Hitler actually went in with double orders. Uh, the, the orders were to take over the Rhineland militarily with a small German military unit. They, the commander was also told if, any, if the French objected to uh, turn around and march back out. Well, the French did nothing. Uh, so the Germany reoccupied the Rhineland in direct defiance of the Treaty of Versailles. Then there was the, uh, the German annexation, which was also forbidden by the Treaty of Versailles. So two, those two actions, Hitler very successfully showed his contempt for the Treaty of Versailles to the great delight of, the, uh, of more and more Germans. Then there was uh, the Munich crisis of 1938, when uh, Chamberlain and Deladier of France essentially gave away uh, Czechoslovakia to Germany. At first it was an issue over the, uh, the German, Germans in Czechoslovakia, the so-called Sudeten Germans. Uh, they had previously been a part of the Austro-Hungarian Empire, uh, and Hitler, Hitler's movement was a pan-German movement. So he was trying to unite Germans all over Europe. Part of the problem was that there were Germans all over Europe that could be united under Hitler's uh, policy, at least in the minds of the uh, of the Germans. Um, so the Munich crisis ended up another victory for Adolf Hitler. Uh, we know that there was significant uh, resistance to Hitler in the German military, and if he had ordered the military invasion of Czechoslovakia, there well may have been a coup against Hitler. But that's well after the fact. And, uh, you know, in fact, you really, really can't ever tell what would have happened. Uh, but in fact, uh, Hitler has another victory at, at Munich. Uh, within a very short time after that, uh, Hitler took over uh, Czechoslovakia and Sol uh, Slovakia uh, and incorporated those uh, places into uh, the German Reich. Then there's the famous Kristallnacht in 1938. It was, provo it was, uh, it was a pogrom against uh, Jews in Germany. Uh, they were simply attacked. Their stores were destroyed. Uh, many people were murdered. It was caused by the fact that a, uh, a German Jew had assassinated a, a German official in the, uh, in the German uh, uh, embassy in Paris. And in retaliation, um, Hitler, Nazi party, ordered uh, Kristallnacht, the, uh, the uh, pogrom, the violent pogrom against the Jews. By that time, many of the German Jews had uh, finally come to the conclusion it's time to leave that up until pretty much up until 1938 uh, a fairly important number of German Jews had felt uh, that maybe Hitler isn't going to be here forever that we can uh, we can ride this out I mean after all it's very hard I should back up and say that uh, among among the Jews of Europe historically the German Jews are among the best assimilated uh, in a country. Uh, they had fought, they had fought uh, heroically for the German nation during World War I. They could not, they could not believe the treatment that they were getting uh, under the Nazis. Uh, and it took a long time for people who had lived for centuries in Germany to expect that uh, Hitler was on a deadly, uh, pursuing a deadly policy. The uh, the Nazi-Soviet pact came in, eight, uh, in August 23rd, 1939, just before the war broke out. Uh, the invasion of Poland, which marks, in Europe at least, the beginning of World War I, uh, World War II, uh, was the 1st of September, 1939. After that, normal immigration was almost impossible. Uh, the war created a city where not only was Germany conquering lands, Poland, for example, where there were large number of numbers of Jews. Since the war was on, Britain and uh, France had finally awakened to the German or to the Nazi threat uh, and declared war on Germany. Uh, after the war broke out, normal immigration was, was not possible. And so uh, uh, beginning in about 1939, Germany changed policy I think from one which was uh, directed toward forcing Jews out of Germany and out of Austria 
that is by making life so uncomfortable for them that they would leave, to one of the final solution. There was a brief, uh, uh, there was a brief uh, consideration of taking a part of the French island of Madagascar and turning that into a Jewish state, but that wasn't possible during the war because the Germans did not control the, uh, control the ocean. And uh, so the final solution gets put together. Now, when Hitler invaded the Soviet Union, he gave an order uh, which uh, told the German, there were special assassination squads, the Einsatztruppen of the SS, who were given the order to physically destroy uh, the Russian commissars, male Jews, and gypsies. Bit by bit, that uh, order takes on uh, Hit, Hit, and Hitler never signed his name to a paper that uh, had the policy of the final solution. There is reference by Goering and Himmler to orders from Hitler to round up and destroy all the European Jews that they can lay their hands on. Uh, so that if you're looking for an order from Hitler signed that says exterminate all the Jews in Europe, you won't find it. You will find references by, by Goering and Himmler, head of the SS, Goering was the, uh, the air marshal, uh, to uh, a Fuhrer order to destroy all of the European Jews. And in 1942, at the Wannsee Conference, uh, there was a decision made to uh, organize the uh, collection and the transportation and the destruction of all the Jews in Europe that uh, Germany had had control over. Now, I have uh, a third page which talks about uh, the statistics. These are fairly recent by Raoul Hilberg, who is a well-known historian of the Holocaust. And uh, you can get a sense of uh, who was rounded up, where. And of course, all these nations were, uh, uh, by 1942, uh, these nations were either under the direct control of the Nazis or allied to the Nazis, and, and hence uh, uh, the leaders of those other countries were willing to carry out or do their, if you will, in the uh, final solution. Uh, in uh, Hitler's final testament, uh, he comes back to this theme, which is a major theme for understanding Nazism, his uh, obsession almost with the destruction of the uh, European Jews. That Hitler, uh, in his final testament, uh, took great pride in the fact that Germany had uh, uh, done so much to uh, rid Europe of what he called the Jewish problem. Uh, so that, that uh, we're at more or less at the end here, the Holocaust in history. Of course, the moral implications of the Holocaust were tremendous. Uh, there's a direct relationship between the Holocaust and the genocide conventions, the definitions of war crimes that came, came out uh, after World War II. Uh, the Holocaust really, I think, in a moral sense, serves as a, the rock bottom uh, of, uh, of uh, disastrous treatment of human beings. That, uh, that the, the Holocaust, uh, in, its, in its destructive effects, uh, essentially is one of the most immoral acts in history. If you're looking for moral absolutes, I would argue, in a, in a sense, you can just you can define moral absolutes uh, in terms of war crimes and the crime of genocide, because I think most nations in the world would agree that such crimes are immoral, and in fact, they've signed conventions against them. Uh, the moral implications for Germany were enormous. Uh, Germany's uh, good name in Europe. Uh, for about 30, 30 or 40 years was virtually destroyed. I remember when I was in France at a time when de Gaulle was in power and very deliberately played on the idea that uh, Germany was kind of a moral pariah. Of course, that enhanced France's uh, position in Europe, which de Gaulle was all too happy to, uh, to do. Uh, but there, there has been lasting impacts on the place of uh, Germany in, uh, in both Europe 
and, uh, and the memory of the uh, Holocaust had been very damaging to, German to the German reputation. Uh, you, of course, you can make the distinction that uh, we often do between Nazis and Germans. Uh, but in fact, uh, uh, it does seem to me that uh, if you're talking about moral responsibility, certainly the, uh, the Nazis are the principals, particularly the Nazi, Nazi leadership. But if you're talking about moral responsibility, if you're talking about accomplices, uh, then it seems to me that you have to include, well, not only the Germans, but other people too. And as we get into this course and consider the moral ramifications, we'll be talking uh, uh, other people uh, who can be brought into this debate over the moral responsibility for the Holocaust. Political implications were very great. Uh, certainly the, uh, the establishment of the State of Israel is in many ways a direct result of the Holocaust of Euro European history. Uh, political implications were uh, important uh, uh, for European nations. I've already mentioned Germany, uh, but uh, but was reconstructed uh, after World War II, in part uh, with the idea that uh, uh, that Germany, which had always been a a central uh, force in Europe, should essentially be divided between the uh, Soviet Union and the Western Allies, Britain, France, and the United States. And uh, that, in, that in part, I think, is related to, uh, to the Holocaust, too. And then, uh, uh, can you find history? any warning signs of future Holocaust? You have to be very careful uh, on this point, I think, because although history can explain the context of the Holocaust, I don't think that through history you can set up some kind of model uh, that would enable you to uh, say if condition one, two, and three was met, uh, that there's going to be a holocaust. That's not the way history works. Uh, I would tend to argue philosophically that all historical contexts are somewhat different. For example, I think you could ever recreate quite the despair of Germany after it lost World War I. I don't really see a context where you could bring into another, you know, establish another Great Depression quite the same way that it hit uh, Germany in the early 1930s. So th there are certain elements of the historical context, it seems to me, will always, they will always be different. I think there are some warning signs that you can talk about with regard to a Holocaust that uh, certainly have to be considered. Uh, one warning sign, of course, is the, uh, uh, is the idea of uh, exclusionism racism, if you will. That is, that uh, an ideology comes into, uh, into force uh, that deliberately distinguishes between people on the basis of uh, superiority versus inferiority. I think another warning sign might well be the idea of a leader, particularly an infallible leader. Okay, because in fact, if you start reading German history, uh, after all those domestic, diplomatic, and military victories, very few people in Germany challenged the infallibility of Adolf Hitler. He was seen as a special person. And uh, that uh, in the early 1941, now the problem with that, if a special person has some, own, some of their own private hatreds, and that they are in a political structure that gives them almost unlimited power, my argument would be that they can turn their private hatreds into public policy. Although, keep in mind that the, uh, the Nazis never publicized what they were doing. They always tried to conduct the final solution in the dark. It was secret. They didn't want to talk about it. The thing that they said, uh, in fact, uh, there, there are statements by Himmler saying that it's a glorious page of German history, but it can never be written about. Obviously because it was, uh, uh, it was such a, uh, a murderous uh, act that was being pursued. So that if you have the, 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 the warning signs that I would uh, tend to take out and to uh, perhaps use as a uh, guide to uh, future danger, 
uh, would be warning signs that would include uh, extreme belief in a particular leader, a policy of exclusion, uh, a, an important series of, uh, of victories, domestic, diplomatic, military, um, just thinking a little bit further here. Uh, oh, yes, violence, violence. That where a society uses violence as a normal means to achieve its political goals or its social goals in the case of the Holocaust, you've got a society that needs watching. And of course, part of a climate of violence is an appeal to emotionalism. Hitler understood very well that emotion, emotion was the real power behind the Nazi ideology. That he got people to suspend what I would call their, uh, their rational faculties, and they ended up going along with victory after victory. And all of a sudden, 1945, in the destroyed Germany, the death camps open up and the Germans, in some respects, were as surprised as uh, the Allies who came in. Now, the Nazi High Command wasn't surprised. They had careful records of what was going on, and from time to time they reported to Hitler. So there are, uh, even though I, I don't think that history ever repeats itself, there are certain warning signs that you can watch out for. And uh, they're, uh, uh, they might be very revealing. So let me stop there. I have a few slides. Can I get... Get the slides on, Carol, and we can run through these. Yeah. Somebody's going to have to turn off the lights right up there, I think. Okay, these are... Uh, I'm not quite sure I can see these myself. Pardon me? Yeah. Um, oh, wait a minute. I can, I can get it. working. Thank you. Boy, I got a big... <laughs> okay. All right, these are just picked... These are just pictures of uh, Hitler uh, as a soldier during World War I. And his pride in his... Uh... There he is. You know what? It's not? No. Oh, okay. No. No, oh, here he is. Here he is. There he is. That's Hitler. Yeah, he looks a little bit, well... Sorry about that. Well. Yeah. There we go. Okay. So we've got a big bundle of wire here. Yeah, but then I'm away from the microphone. I will shout. Um, here's. You can't see it, but here's Hitler, and here he is in the blown-up section. This is at a rally early in the 1920s. Well, that was before the war, actually. The, the, the declaration of the war, that was the time. And the war was declared. That was the problem. Oh, okay, 1914? Yes. Okay. Now I've done something here. Oh, here we go. 
All right, here's, uh, here's Hitler as a young leader of the Nazi party. Here's Hitler out in the street demonstration of World War I. Here's Hitler with uh, uh, Eva Brown, who he finally married just before he died in the uh, bunker in Berlin in 1945. Uh, well, yeah. Just those two. Just two are upside down. They were some of my best slides, so we have to catch them. So here's a, uh, there are two here by John Hartfield. And of course, this was a uh, uh, photo montage. Uh, it was a faked photograph putting Hitler into a uniform. <clears throat> the second one is going in. So I think let's see what we can do here. Just got taken out again. I knew I, sh I knew I should have checked those before I. I didn't hear you say there's only two. Pardon me? She didn't hear you say there's oh. only two. Oh. Well, could somebody tell Carol then there's only two? Okay, so we go back. Can you? You're going to have to go back manually. It's not working. Go back manually. Okay, fine. Great. Uh, okay, this is, uh, well, this is turned around. Okay, it's Hitler's view of the world. Uh, of course, Hitler should be over on the other side here, but he's looking at France, and France has all kinds of guns. Uh, here's Mussolini in Italy, who is already leading the Italian fascists. Here's, here's John Bull. Um, here's Germany all tied up, and here's the knight, Hitler. Oh, here are the Russians. They're doing their crazy revolutionary things up in the Soviet Union. Uh, here's, uh, here's the Polish, uh, Marshal Pilsudski. Uh, he's kind of riding on the back of uh, Poland, and here's Hitler. Hitler's going to set things right. Where did that appear? Uh, well, that, that's just, that was just made up. That was uh, kind of a view. Of, of Germany. That was made up recently. Okay, here's Germany in 1914 and the Austro-Hungarian Empire and Bulgaria and they don't they don't really show you the Ottoman Empire. But look what happened in 1920. Uh, Germany lost, uh, well, Czechoslovakia was made up of what had been the, for the most part, the Austro-Hungarian Empire. Austria and Hungary, Yugoslavia were new, Latvia, uh, Lithuania, Latvia, Estonia, and Finland were new. Poland was new. The whole map of, of uh, Central and Eastern Europe was remade. Here's uh, John Hartfield's uh, photo montage of, of Hitler as a Prussian officer. Here's another one. This is actually pretty good. Another John Hartfield. Uh, see, this is, here's, and the caption is, have no fear, he's a vegetarian. Uh, well, I'm, I'm afraid the French had some fear anyway. But um, in France, Nazism was a very divisive subject because there were French fascists who, who believed it was better to have Hitler in France than to have Leon Blum, who was a social democrat, as the, as the uh, prime minister of France. Okay, here's a, uh, these are posters, and basically, 
This is a, uh, a poster on behalf of the Social Democrats warning the German workers what will happen to them if the fascists take over. They'll essentially be crucified on the twisted cross. Okay, so that it's, a, it's, an, it's an election poster urging German workers to vote for the Social Democratic Party. And here you have uh, a poster of a Nazi fist smashing parliamentary session of the German Reichstag, a recognition that, uh, that the, uh, the nationalist bloc, particularly the, the Nazis, were a menace to the liberal government of the Weimar Republic. Here's a, uh, here's a, a uh, German Nazi poster, National Socialist. It basically says that uh, vote National Socialist so that the soldiers of World War I will not have died in vain. Here's another election poster showing the Nazi version of the Bolshevik menace in Russia. The monster there, uh, basically it says, uh, the only hope against Bolshevism is Adolf Hitler. It's a reflection of the, uh, of the ideological conflict uh, of the 1920s and the early 1830s. Nick? Oh, here we go. Uh, here's, a, uh, here's Goering looking at the burned, uh, burned out ruins of the Reichstag, which Hitler and the Nazis blamed on the, uh, on the communists. There was a Dutch communist who took the blame. He was kind of a, uh, uh, he was uh, mentally unstable. And I, I think people generally believe today that he was simply used by the Nazis. And uh, he claimed he had set the fire and uh, Hitler used it very to rid the Reichstag of the German Communist Party, thus giving the, fat, the German Nazis a, uh, a majority. Uh, here are, right after Hitler came to power, these are German Communists lined up against the wall. They're on their way to a concentration camp. Here's a German um, uh, Brown. soldier, brown shirt, brown shirt. SA arresting. Uh, here's a poster from France. Again, it shows the ideological conflict in the 1930s. Basically, it, uh, uh, it says, uh, French, wake up. Uh, communism has already set fire to two parts of Europe, Soviet Union and to Spain. This came out at the time of the Spanish Civil War. Uh, which, in fact, uh, liberal, liberal Britain and liberal France and liberal, the liberal United States did nothing, took no sides in the uh, Spanish Civil War. Uh, here's here's uh, Neville Chamberlain at Munich in 1938. Uh, here, here he's waving that famous piece of paper that said, peace in our time. And within a year, a little bit more than a year, Britain had declared war on Germany. And here's a kind of a funny cartoon by David Lau. And basically, uh, it says, uh, uh, why should we take a stand about someone, someone else, when it's all so far away? And well, here's German militarism pushing on uh, Austria and uh, Czechoslovakia and the Balkans and the East and northern, northwestern Europe and France and finally England still carrying the, uh, the basket of eggs of the British Empire. This is a David Lau cartoon. And this is a, a British uh, doctoring of a, German, of a German stamp to make Hitler look like uh, uh, a deadly person. And here's the famous marriage between the uh, August Pact the Nazi Soviet pact where Joe Stalin and Hitler get married. This, this, was, a, uh, this was an unbelievable action because all through the 1930s, uh, the, uh, the Soviets had seen Hitler else from the uh, to Germany, to Russia, to France, and to Britain. So that they all, they all take a, uh, have a share of the blame. Uh, what's usually seen as one of the key factors was that uh, after the, the assassination of the Archduke Francis Ferdinand at Sarajevo 
1914, which was kind of the trigger to the war, uh, Austria gave Serbia an ultimatum. And Germany essentially was, uh, is blamed for letting the Hungarian Empire get a kind of blank check of German support for the Austrian ultimatum. That a lot of historians feel that Germany should not have been so generous. Uh, but in fact, uh, uh, Germany and Austria were close. Uh, the Kaiser was a personal friend of Francis Ferdinand who had been assassinated. I mean, there are all kinds of things that work in uh, to an explanation of the, uh, the so-called blank check. Uh, and but Empire was a, uh, was a pan-Slavic movement. They supported Serbia. Uh, once the ultimatum was given, that put into action the mobilization plans of the Russian army. And Germany said to Russia that you either demobilize or uh, we will declare war on you. And you have all the military alliances. It's, it's, uh, uh, it, it does seem to me that the key thing is that war was much more accepted in 1914 as a way of resolving differences. Today we use it, but you don't hear people say it's the, it's the greatest of all social activities because we know that's false. Yes? right at the beginning of World War II, and they chose to ignore those reports. Well, see, okay, but you've got to be careful what you mean by the death camp, because the Von Sea Conference clearly was in January of 1942. The war started in 39. Now, there were concentration camps, and it's true that when the I'd been uh, uh, killed in mass and had been pumped out, what you're telling me is true, but I can't believe that that's happening. That, that was one of the things that... Uh, happened with the Holocaust, it was, it was just too difficult to believe that somebody would just go ahead with a uh, policy of genocide, an intentional policy of genocide. Yes? I don't mean to sound ignorant, but how did um, the Nazis decide that it was the Jews that were such awful people? Well, see, I, I, I relate that to Hitler. He says very clearly, in my... Oh, the question is, how did the Nazis decide that the Jews were, were the, uh, the conspirators of history? And I, I, I relate that very much to Hitler. Uh, if you, you can read in Mein Kampf, Hitler writes very clearly, I became an anti-Semite in Vienna prior to World War I. And Hitler goes into a long description of the fact that the Jews are running Vienna. Anti-Semitism was not a religious one, but yeah. it started to be there, perhaps the uh, most racist one at that particular time, of uh, Hitler's uh, uh, youth and uh, his, his stay in, in Vienna. So that was the time when the, the religious anti-Semitism turned into uh, racism, which means that uh, the religion is a uh, product of that developed very strongly in Austria in the years of Hitler's youth. The, the distinction is that uh, pretty much all of Europe had, over the, over the years, developed a kind of religiously based anti-Semitism. The Jews had never wanted to become Christians. I mean, it goes all the way back uh, in German history to uh, Martin Luther. Uh, he invited the uh, German Jews to become Christians, and they said, no, thank you. And uh, Hitler, their, uh, excuse me, uh, statements by Martin Luther against German Jews for not recognizing that Christianity is the only true religion. Uh, but it's a little bit difficult, I think, to link religious anti-Semitism to the kind of violent, biologically based anti-Semitism that developed uh, in Austria and in other parts of Europe that essentially claimed that the Jews are bad because they're biologically inferior. And not, not because they're religiously different, if they're, because you had a tough, you know, I mean, if, rationally speaking, there were some difficulties there. If they were biologically inferior, how could they put together all these conspiracies? How could they rule the world? And be so you know, superior. Yeah. And be so superior. If, I mean, you know, see, if you start, if you start becoming uh, rational about the claims, of inferiority, they don't stand up very well. But that's one of the reasons why the Nazis pushed emotionalism. Yes? Because of the depression in those countries, 
when people are looking for scapegoats for making excuses for their own problems? Yeah, except you got to be careful. I mean, if you consider, for example, the Cambodian genocide to be a genocide. Um, yeah, I, 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 would, I would argue that the Cambodian genocide was essentially a, uh, uh, an exclusionary, it, more politically based, more based on the idea that uh, to be a, uh, a good Cambodian, you had to be a Khmer Rouge. If you were at all tainted with any kind of outside influence, if you spoke Vietnamese, if you had a Western orientation and spoke French, you were suspect. And, you know, clearly uh, uh, the people in the Pol Pot movement, I mean, their, their back, the background of that movement was that they were the Cambodian peasantry. Okay. The, the, the question was that on the uh, handout that lists the, uh, 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 the number of uh, Jews from different countries in Europe that died in the death camps, uh, Germany, Germany and Austria, well, Germany is 120,000. Now, there were somewhere around, it's been estimated that the number of German Jews were only, they were about 1% of the population. Okay, so that you're not, you weren't dealing initially with a whole lot in terms of the German population. Of those, roughly, uh, it looks from this, roughly about uh, uh, 120,000 out of, say, around 800,000, you're, you're talking, uh, uh, 15 to 20 percent of the uh, German Jews died in the in the camps. About half of them had gotten out. Yeah. Um, yes, over here. You can speak a little about where they they considered that regardless of your economic position in society, as long you were a good German, as long as you supported the Nazi Party. And the Germans made no attempt to destroy capitalism once they came to power. They assumed, and they were right on this, that the capitalists would support the Nazi policies, uh, rearmament uh, and expansionism in Europe. And they were, they were correct on that assumption. But beyond that, I think it's very important that particularly those who were to lose it all under the communists. And so therefore, the Nazis were a... Uh, alternative to communism, particularly for those who were haves, and I think that's a very important argument. Mm -hmm. oh, yeah. It was the a element. lesser evil, not that they particularly <laughs> identified, but it was to them a lesser evil mm -hmm. than communism, or for all practical purposes, the social democrats. Also an element of labor union busting. Yeah. You got, you got uh, uh, to find out, and it's concentration camps where the uh, the leaders of the Communist Party and the Social Democratic Party and a few liberals. Also, perhaps it's important, just as a date, that you'll be getting a handout in terms of important dates uh, through the 12-year uh, Nazi right. Uh, the first concentration camp was Dachau, and that was established in 1933, very quickly after Hitler came into power. Uh, way up in the back, and then Strode. Lesser of two evils. You were referring during the slides to Charles Lindbergh and Henry Ford, the people in this country. Yes. You referred to America first, and you said uh, so called America first, and I know nothing about that. Just... Oh, well, I mean, it, it, it was called, I shouldn't have used the word so called. It was called the America First Movement, and the, the America First Movement was uh, fundamentally isolationist. And it, it battled against Franklin Roosevelt, who believed uh, that uh, the United States had a uh, world role to play. Uh, and it's the old fight in American politics between isolationism and interventionism. And the America Firsters were all for isolationism. Because, go ahead. Just to follow up on what you mentioned, you hear a lot of speculation about Lindbergh and, in addition, Henry Ford. <laughs> I'm not coming in with any prior knowledge. I'm, I'm asking, is there any strong indication which were they? Was it just a case of the lesser of two evils? Were they American industrialists? Or were they pathetic, sympathetic to Hitler? Well, I, I would say that, uh, from my knowledge, that both Henry Ford and Lindbergh were sympathetic to Hitler. Now, that doesn't mean they were sympathetic to the Holocaust. Okay? We're, we're talking in the 1930s before the Holocaust was ever uh, developed. I mean, my argument is the Holocaust develops 
in the period 1941 to 42 that the intention of deliberately destroying European Jews so that the support for Hitler it was what read by very many Americans against the international jury and that I think is something which also uh, played a very important role in developing the sympathies for, for the Nazi movement and especially Adolf Hitler and the uh, silver shirts and the very many movements here in the United States during the 30s were precisely very sympathetic uh, to Hitler's uh, National Socialism or Hitlerism. You, you had in the state foreign students at the university. I couldn't raise to stand back there, Paul. Uh, actually, if you take a look at old movies, you see that the German trucks were Ford trucks. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but they had Ford. They had Ford plants in Germany. Uh, Ford and Ford and what you call Opel Blitz is General Motors. Yeah. Uh, yeah, but I mean, see, those those plants were established in Germany. Somebody can look up what the bombing pat yeah. patterns were. Well, okay. Yeah. Yeah. Be more yeah. I think structural. Uh, and uh, the uh, San Jose Mercury, I believe it was January 2nd of this year, that talked about the interning of uh, Italian and German nationals, and they gave the number 14,000, which uh, I had never heard uh, anything regarding that entire episode at all. One generally hears uh, specifically about Japanese, and that yeah. number is 127,000, I believe. Yes. But, uh, do you have any other source for the number of Jap or, uh, Italian or Germans who were? No, I don't. I don't have any source for that. Uh, uh, I, I do did not believe the uh, actions taken against Italian Jews were uh, much less than those taken against other Jews in Europe who were under Nazi control. Jean? Uh, back to the uh, subject of the root causes of German anti-Semitism and what Hitler played on. Uh, a book to read called Hitler in Vienna. I forget the name of the author. <laughs> But Kubitschek. It's very, it's a, Kubitschek. 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 Yeah, right. This, yeah, Kubitschek was, uh, and this, uh, he's writing about his, uh, a lot of information about, about Hitler. Okay, in the last part of the 19th century, there were small, very, very vicious anti-Semitic parties that uh, were in the various legislatures. Uh, in Central Europe and, and Germany. They never got very far, but they were always there with a few seats. They had an organization. And Hitler used to go into these bookstores and get these pamphlets from these uh, minor anti-Semitic parties. And this is one of the things that uh, cultivated his anti-Semitism. Now, if you just skip over to 1920, <coughs> With this background, in okay, so they're small parties, but they were there. The fact that they could have a few seats in and infiltrating into the public, <coughs> and you end up with a dissatisfied situation due to the Versailles Treaty, uh, you have a cultural milieu here for a demagogue to fix on, and that certainly played a part. In um, somebody will, this young lady? Do you have in your list of future Holocaust warning signs? Yes. Domestic? And of the Arabs from Israel. Uh, but they're, they're not, uh, they're talking about expulsion, it seems to me. They're not talking about genocide. So I, I don't see it, I don't see genocide there, but it's a very, very, it's a very, very, uh, uh, unstable situation. Yeah. Great among historians regarding the role of the Catholic Church or non-role of the Catholic Church during this. Uh, um, I just wanted to expect of the, the uh, tailspin of the Weimar Republic that, that you didn't mention, um, namely the ruinous inflation that was suffered in Germany in 1922 and 1923, when essentially the whole middle German middle class lost its material existence. It lost its savings because the money that they had saved was suddenly absolutely worthless, and people were taking uh, wheelbarrow loads full of uh, bills to the baker shop to buy a loaf of bread. Uh, and so more of the uh, social and economic factors that contributed to chaos in Germany in well, the 1920s. 
20s. Yeah, but you got to be a little careful on that because in the Weimar Republic there was a recovery from about 1925-26 to about 1929. There was a recovery of the German economy and looked for a, a while as if the Weimar Republic was going to make it. And then it got hit by the Great Depression. And so, you know, what you could say, what you could probably say is that the memory of the early 20s who claimed that he was a child of the revolution, that he wanted to export the, the ideas of the uh, French Revolution at the point of a sword. And, uh, uh, you know, that doesn't, if you're a German, you've got no reason to, uh, to agree with Napoleon Bonaparte that, he, that Germany is going to be better off if Napoleon's successful. And so that, uh, uh, in fact, there was a, a very important war between France and uh, Germany, Franco-Prussian War, in 1870-1871, that Germany had only invaded France once in something like uh, 200 years. Uh, whereas France had invaded German states about 30 times. He, he was going back to uh, uh, Louis, uh, Louis the Fourteenth and Napoleon uh, and other other French people. So it's pretty one-sided. I still would say that uh, Frederick the Great, the uh, Prussian authoritarian notion of obedience, and I think plays a very important <coughs> role in that, which became a tradition and was carried over pretty much up to Hitler's time. Hitler actually made it more severe, used that as a basis, but developed it even further. The Prussian militarism and the uh, spirit of ob obedience during the times of Frederick the Great and his father, by the way. So, uh, how about two more questions or comments? Developing this question further, you said that the uh, Weimar... ...not be permitted to... the people. So even under the autocratic state, the Germans prospered relatively, uh, you know, well, and, and had freedoms. Yeah, well, um, it, it's, it's entirely true that under the, uh, the Wilhelminian state, that Germans made great advances economically and socially, the, in terms of... Uh, uh, insurance, old age insurance, and working conditions. There's no doubt, if you read German history, that uh, the German, the German uh, state in the last part of the 19th century was an advanced uh, state in terms of economic and social benefits. Bob? Yes? They also had the leading universities, they had the outstanding artists, composers, literature. They well, they had, certainly they had a very, very, uh, you know, well-established educational system, too. Well, let's, let's leave it there today. Thank you very much.